Well, I wonder what your favorite Christmas present was that you ever received as far as humans go, okay? Not, not spiritually, but uh, humanly speaking. Save that thought. Think about it and save the thought because I'm going to close with the best Christmas gift ever received and ever given and trust that you will be able to take along with you that thought. Our big idea for today is this. I need to receive God's gift of love and give it to others. Say it with me, please. I need to receive God's gift of love and give it to others. Say it one more time. I need to receive God's gift of love and give it to others. With all the gifts that are being given and received today, I was reminded of this story, a very interesting human interest story. The only son of a very wealthy man had his 21st birthday on Christmas Day. His mother gave him some gold cufflinks and engraved gold pens. His aunt and uncle bought him a set of tailor-made golf clubs, which he loved as he was an avid golfer. And he expected to receive a sports car from his father, as he had dropped a lot of hints over the course of the previous year. Instead, his dad told him that he loved him and handed him a wrapped-up present. When he opened it, he found it was a box containing a leather-bound Bible with his name inscribed on the spine. Angry, the young man tossed the box and Bible aside and stormed out of the house yelling, with all your money, all you can give me is a Bible. And they never spoke again, despite the fact that the young man's father tried hard to contact him on many occasions. Years later, he got a call from his uncle to say that his father had died, leaving him everything. When he returned to the homestead, as he was going through his father's belongings, he found that Bible still in its box. Now curious, he took the Bible out of the box and opened it. The pages fell out open at a passage his father had marked, and as he looked at the page, he noticed that his dad had underlined Matthew 7, 11. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your father give what is good to those who ask him? And as he read it, a car key fell from inside the Bible. It had a tag with the dealer's name on it for the sports car that he had wanted years earlier. And on the tag beside the date of his 21st birthday, he read the words, Paid in full. Love, Dad. I would like you to say with me one more time the big idea, please. I need to receive God's gift of love and give it to others. You see, on that very first Christmas day, God gave the world the greatest Christmas present of all time. And I want to briefly talk to you today about a verse that all of you know by memory, if you've ever been to Sunday school as a child. I like us to think about God's greatest gift and what we have done with it. And so John 3.16 is our text today. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Six, six things about God's gift of love. Number one, the giver of the gift is God. The giver of the gift, God. This is the same God from Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the God who made the entire universe, he's the one who is offering this gift. God himself. 
What was the motive for the gift? What's the motive for the gift? The Bible says God so loved. The motive for the gift is unconditional love. God gave the gift because of his unconditional love. Romans 5.8 says, But God shows his great love for us in this. Christ died for us while we were still sinners. God's love then clearly is not based on our spiritual condition or on our moral predisposition. It isn't based on our behavior or our attitude toward God. In fact, this is one of the things that sets God apart from every other God held up by every other world religion. At a comparative religions conference, there was a spirited debate about what is unique about Christianity. Someone suggested the concept of incarnation, the idea that God took human form in Jesus, and someone else quickly said, well, that actually other faiths believe God appears in human form. Another suggestion was offered at this debate, at this comparative religions conference, what about resurrection? The belief that death's not the final word, that the tomb was found empty. Well, someone slowly shook their head. Other religions have accounts of people returning from the dead. Well, then as the story is told, C.S. Lewis walked into the room, tweed jacket, arms full of papers, a little early for his presentation. He sat down and took in the conversation. By now, it had evolved into a fierce debate. Finally, during a lull, he spoke out saying, what's all this rumpus about anyway? Everyone turned in his direction, for he was famous and well-known. Trying to explain themselves, they said, well, we're debating what's unique about Christianity. Oh, that's easy, answered Lewis. It's grace. The room fell silent. Lewis continued that Christianity uniquely claims God's love comes free of charge, no strings attached. No other religion makes that claim. After a moment, someone commented that Lewis had a point. Buddhists, for example, follow an eightfold path to enlightenment. It's not a free ride. Hindus believe in karma, that your actions continually affect the way the, way the world will treat you. That there's nothing that comes to you not set in motion by your own actions. Someone else observed that the Jewish code of the law implies God has requirements for people to be acceptable to him. And in Islam, God is a God of judgment, not a God of love. You live to appease him. At the end of the discussion, everyone concluded Lewis indeed had a point. Only Christianity dares to proclaim God's love is unconditional, an unconditional love that we call grace. Christians boldly proclaim that grace really has precious little to do with us, our inner resolve, or our lack of inner resolve. Rather, grace is all about God and God freely giving to us the gifts of forgiveness, mercy, and love. So God's love for us then is unconditional. And you and I have a hard time with that concept. We really do. Because we, we know and we say that we want to try to love people like God does, but we all admit, if we're honest, it's really hard to love people who are not returning your love. It's really hard to love people who have hatred toward you. God's love is unconditional. It is as Philip Yancey once wrote, there is nothing we can do to make God love us more. There's nothing we can do to make God love us less. The objects of the gift, God so loved the world. The world, the Greek word for world there, cosmos, is defined as the ungodly multitude, the whole mass of men alienated from God, therefore hostile to the cause of Christ. That's the world God loved. It doesn't say God loved all the good guys or that God loved all the Jews or even that God loved all the Christians, saints, believers. It says God so loved the world. The whole world, anyone, God loves everyone. And by the way, that does not mean that there is such a thing as universal salvation, that everyone in the whole world is saved, okay? That's not what we're saying. What we are saying is that God loved 
the world. Now, notice the sacrifice of the gift. The sacrifice. He gave his only son. God didn't have many sons. He had one son. He gave his only son. 1 John 4.10 tells us, This is real love. It is not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. We love him because he first loved us. And by the way, when we say God's love is unconditional and it's all about grace, that does not mean that we should not return the love. It means that we do it because of love, not to earn God's favor. The sacrifice. He gave his only son. By the way, I believe he would have done that if you were the only person in the world. If I was the only person in the world. Now notice the accessibility of the gift. You say, what's that mean? Well, accessibility has to do with who, who it's available to, who can get it. Whoever believes in him. See, the really good news about God's love is it's not limited to a select few. It's not available to only those who were born with the right color of skin or on the right continent. And it's not difficult to obtain. It's not reserved for only the intellectual elite or the power brokers or the financial wizards. No, the love of God is accessible to whoever believes in Jesus, the only Son of God. Now, what does it mean to believe? That, that's the sticking point. Because it's not just a simple, well, I believe, and so that, that takes care of it. Scripture says that the devils also believe and tremble, doesn't it? James tells us that. And so believe more, means more than just an intellectual assent to the, the fact of Jesus Christ. Believe means to trust in him alone plus nothing for your salvation. To trust in Jesus Christ alone plus nothing. It's not Jesus plus works. It's not Jesus plus baptism. It's not Jesus plus church membership. It's Jesus only. And when I trust in him, that means I completely, completely trust him as my Lord. Not just my Savior, but my Lord. That's why Romans 10, 9 says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. The word Lord means what? It means master. It means ruler. It also means boss. And so we don't, we don't have the right to do like Peter did when he said to Jesus on one occasion, not so, Lord. You don't say no to your boss, to your Lord. But whoever believes in him, that's who it's available to. And notice the benefits of this gift, the benefits. What's the good of this gift? What's the benefit? Well, we can talk about it negatively and positively. Negatively, first of all, it says, will not perish. Whoever believes in him shall not perish. God's goal in sending his son from heaven to earth was not to condemn you or show you how bad you are, how unworthy you are, how hopeless you are. God's only desire in sending his son was to show you his love and draw you into a love relationship with himself. Jesus did not come into the world to rebuke you. He came to rescue you. He didn't come to criticize you. He came to cleanse you. He didn't come to punish you. He came to pardon you. He didn't come to destroy you. He came to deliver you. I like verses 17 and 18 of John 3. Those verses which follow our text say, God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but to save it. There is no judgment awaiting those who trust him, but those who do not trust him have already been judged for not believing in the only son of God not perish. That's the negative benefit. The positive benefit, they'll have everlasting life. Have everlasting life. You see, my friends, the Bible says that there's a penalty for sin, which is death. And when it says death, it doesn't just mean physical death. Romans 6, 23, the penalty for sin is death, eternal death, separation from God forever. And by the way, the longer you live in this world, the more and more you're going to hear preachers, sadly, and other people say, well, there's not any real hell. That's not a real place. That's an old-fashioned, out-of-date out idea. A God of love would not send anybody to hell. Well, guess what? 
God doesn't send people to hell. People send themselves to hell. That's what that says. See, And hell's a real place. It's a real place. Jesus had more to say about hell than he did about heaven. Now, heaven's real. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. But Jesus warned people about hell. It wasn't made for man. It was made for the devil and his angels. And that's why God sent his son Jesus to be the Savior. The Bible says that while the penalty for sin is death, God's gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's why David could say, when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear, because I know that surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Three questions as we close. First question, have I accepted God's gift of love? Have I accepted? Was there a time in your life when you recognize that you're born with a sinful nature like the rest of the human race is? And with understanding, you realize that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and that it's not automatic. God doesn't force salvation on anybody. He says, if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and believe in your heart that God raised from the dead, you will receive eternal life. For whosoever shall call, that means ask. So you have to ask for it. You have to ask for it. So I hope your reaction to God's wonderful gift will be a good one. I hope you will not turn away from it as a young man turned away from his father's gift and lose out on the wonderful present. You can accept it or you can reject it. The choice is yours. Now, the second question is probably more important this morning for those of us who are assembled here than the first. Well, that's very important. But I would believe that most people who find themselves in God's house would say, of course, yeah, what do you think I'm coming to church for? I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. So the second question is very important. Have I given God's gift of love to anyone? Have I given God's gift of love to anyone? Final question. Who do I know? And I deliberately left a blank there, and I would like to ask you to ask God to bring some people to your mind by name. And you don't have to fill it in now unless you can think of someone. Who do I know that needs the gift? Who do I know that needs the gift? How many of you read the daily bread every day? Okay. I ask that because then you will have already read this. My wife and I have a habit. I read it on my phone. I have the daily bread app on my phone. I read it before I leave and go to work and we pray together in the morning. And as I read this one, on December 22nd, I said, wow, that's the perfect close to my message on God's gift of love. If you haven't read it, you might want to go back and pull it out. It's titled, The Best Gift Ever. The Best Gift Ever. At a winter retreat in northern New England, one of the men asked the question, what was your favorite Christmas gift ever? One athletic man seemed eager to answer. That's easy, he said, glancing at his friend next to him. A few years back, I finished, playing, I finished college thinking I was a sure bet to play professional football. When it didn't happen, I was angry. Bitterness ate at me, and I shared that bitterness with anyone who tried to help me. On the second Christmas and second season without football, I went to a Christmas play at this guy's church, he said, gesturing toward his friend. Not because I wanted Jesus, but just to see my niece in her Christmas pageant. It's hard to describe what happened because it sounds silly, but right in the middle of that kid's play, I felt like I needed to be with those shepherds and angels meeting Jesus. When the crowd finished singing Silent Night, I just sat there weeping. I got my best Christmas present ever that very night, he said, again pointing at his friend, when this guy sent his family home without him, 
so he could tell me how to meet Jesus. It was then that his friend piped up, and that, guys, was my best Christmas present ever. This, this Christmas, may the joyful simplicity of the story of Jesus' birth be the story that we tell to others so that we can give the best Christmas present ever. And when somebody receives it, that will be our best Christmas present ever. God's gift of love. Let's say our big idea one last time. I need to receive God's gift of love and give it to others. Let's bow our heads and arms, please as we close. If you've never received God's gift of love personally, I invite you to do that right now. You can pray this prayer with me. Dear Heavenly Father, just quietly from your heart, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to be born in a manger and live a sinless life and die on the cross for my sins. Thank you that you so loved the world and so loved me. I ask Jesus now to be my Lord and Savior. Forgive my sins. Make me your child. Help me now to live my life for you and tell others what I've done. Help me to give this gift to others this Christmas season. Thank you for hearing my prayer and giving me eternal life and salvation. In Jesus' name I pray. With well, their heads still bowed and eyes still closed, if you prayed that prayer in a minute, maybe this is the first time that you prayed it with understanding. You don't need to pray it over and over again, but everybody needs to do it once with understanding. I'd like to thank God for hearing you and saving you. Would you lift your hand right now if you prayed that prayer this morning with me on this Christmas day? Heavenly Father, I thank you again for Jesus. We thank you for the best Christmas gift that you ever gave, the gift of love, in your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us not only to receive the gift, but help us to give the gift. Help us to use our influence with friends and loved ones and associates at work and use gospel tracts and use our testimony and whatever else you send our way to share with people the good news that Jesus loves them and died for them. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.